Well, welcome everybody, if I already say so, and uh, good to uh, be with you. We are in the book of James, and we'll be uh, picking up in chapter two uh, today. Um, <clears throat> James, you recall, has told us last week that we are to speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. One of the things you see in James is this emphasis on um, living out what you believe. Um, I've already seen him, uh, heard him say to us that we're not to be hearers of the word only, but doers. Uh, not to, to go away from, from uh, listening to, to, to the word, the, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, um, without, without responding to it. In, in, in some way, and response uh, for James and response for uh, other biblical writers as well has to do with what we do, how we, how we organize our lives around this new thing that we have been told, that we believe, this new, this new word that we uh, understand from God. And so uh, James takes for granted that what we've heard in the gospel, what we've heard in Jesus uh, is uh, intended to change us and to make us different people in the way we live our lives. Uh, it's not just something we we hear and kind of nod and go, hmm, okay, that's an interesting interesting position, an interesting take on the world. It's it's supposed to make us change our lives and be different uh, because of it. Uh, so with that in mind, as we turn to verse 14 in chapter 2, uh, James is going to continue this, this emphasis on what we do. Uh, and that bothers some people. And, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. That, that, that bothers Christians. It has through the, the centuries. That's, that's been challenging enough to kind of the way we often think about salvation and, and sort of the, the, the false categories that we, we try to impose on it. Um, and it's caused people to have some, some real problems with James. Um, as, as we read through this, maybe you'll understand a little bit why Martin Luther uh, basically said, disregard James. I'm not even sure it ought to be in the Bible. <laughs> why, why he really had a, a struggle with it. Um, and, and, and maybe you'll kind of catch some of the reason for that as we, as we read here. So starting in verse 14, let's just read it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds. Let's just pause there for a second. How would, you, how would you answer that question? What good is it if you have faith and no deeds? If you didn't know the rest of James, if you didn't know what came next, what do you think about that question? Is it really possible that, that faith can be, well, how would you respond to it? What good is it if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Well, if you have faith, you uh, become a Christian result of your faith, then your life should change in some way. Okay. And that would be shown to change in your life by the deeds you do. If, you don't, if, if nothing changes in your life, you have to question whether you really gave your life to Christ. God. Okay. Is that he set up a straw man that doesn't exist? What's that? Point is that he set up a straw man that doesn't exist for the sake of argument. Okay, in what way? There is nobody that has faith and does nothing in response to it. Okay, it makes no sense. <laughs> well, that's uh, you mentioned by Martin Luther. His quality actually was that James is a book of straw, pistol of straw, fit for burning. <laughs> he, yeah, yeah, he was not. He was not impressed with James because, and if you, and you start to understand this, uh, as we read here, you'll see, you'll see the issue. Luther's big thing, of course, was he discovered through scripture the, the idea of justification by grace through faith. Um, and, and that was huge for Luther. That was a revelation for him. It's not something that was new. It was just something that was kind of new to him, something he didn't really understand uh, as well as, as perhaps he should have. And, and so he was, that to him was liberating. 
That was exciting. So now he reads James. Not to mean exactly the same thing. Yeah, that's that's exactly true. That's exactly right. Let's keep reading here. What good is it if someone claims to have faith but no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and, and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shut it. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, and not by faith alone. Do you start to see why Luther had a problem with this? If he's, if he's, if, if his whole thing is, uh, we're saved by faith in Christ and not by works. James seems to say just the opposite, and in fact, James seems to say just the opposite from Paul in Ephesians two, for instance. You're saved by grace through faith, uh, right? So turn. Turn to Ephesians 2 there in your Bibles, just to say. But this isn't really talking about salvation. It's talking about faith and deeds. Okay. <laughs> so it kind of is. It kind of is. So, yeah. It is, but it's a different, it's, it's a it's, different vocabulary. You're yes. right. You're right. You're right. Um, verse uh, 8 of. You can't have one without the other, but. Verse 8 of Ephesians 2. It is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. But Paul says you're saved by grace through faith, not by works. James says your faith and your works go together. Uh, and, and, and how can you be saved if you have faith without works? Well, one is saying if you're saved by your work, grace is not needed. Okay. And that's the problem here. And James is dealing with a group of people in the Ephesus church, believing that, you know, um, we can we can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps to be saved. And that's contrary to grace. That's a big no, no. When it comes to grace, it's God's favor that he's allowed us to know. And then the whole faith piece is. He created us to be workmen. Ephesians later on talks about that, right? And so right. it, it's it's both, but it's an understanding the bookends of this whole grace and faith, grace and faith, but it's not either or. Paul would not disagree that faith should produce works. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, in Paul's letters, often what happens is you have the first couple of chapters, two or three chapters, kind of talk about the gospel, right? And talk about the, the theology of the gospel. And then at some point, about halfway through Paul's letters, you usually get something like, therefore, <laughs> and the therefore is the rest of the letter. And it's about, now, how do you live based on this? And that's when you see Paul say things like, you know, quit doing these things and start doing these things. Uh, start being like this. Uh, see yourself in this way and and see others in this way. Um, and then the next verse of what you read there yeah. in Ephesians, it says we're created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Mm -hmm. So the, the grace, from, if we've really, I don't know, taken that in, that should open us up to mm -hmm. do the works. And I think it, the idea is, you know, if you're, if that grace and that faith is not producing these good works, then you have to question, well, you know, is it really there? And that seems to me what, 
what he's getting. Yeah, at. both Matt and Laura kind of talked about in, in different ways, a different sort of vocabulary, a different uh, way of, of speaking and <clears throat> defining some terms in both of these in both of these letters, Ephesians and in James. Um, and, well, it's easy to say that Paul is saying you're saved by faith and James is saying you're saved by works, and actually both of those are false. Faith doesn't save you any more than works do. They're both inadequate. We need God's grace to make up the difference either way. James doesn't say you were saved by works alone. He says you need faith and works. They work together, he's going to say. And Abraham is, is his example. Interestingly, Abraham is one of Paul's examples too, and the same, the same episode. For, for saying that you're, you're, you're uh, declared uh, the same uh, verse, at least the same reference, you're, you're, uh, that Abraham was, uh, was declared righteous uh, because of his faith. <laughs> uh, and it was, uh, he, he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Um, he made himself righteous the way he did this. Like right, right, right. We're right. both talking about the same thing. How do we respond to the grace? What's the catalyst in which? respond to it yeah so yeah I, and i think that's really important and it's good it's good i think we're, we're differentiating here paul is writing in ephesians to a church that they're they're apparently needing to know that the gentiles among them and the jews among them are kind of on the same foot uh, they both need the grace of god they both they both need the cross they both need jesus to uh make them righteous uh, and so because of that, they can look at each other differently. They can, they can overcome the barrier between them in Christ because they both have received uh, salvation through God's grace by faith. Um, and, and James is talking, writing to Christians who, uh, who need to know that your faith is supposed to do something in your life. It's supposed to make you different. And, and so uh, it's a great example, as you, as you look at these two uh, books of the Bible, it's a great example of how sometimes you have to, to, to understand Scripture properly. You've got to take into account uh, what the authors were trying to do. You, you've got to, you got to kind of wrestle with, uh, with trying to figure out what exactly is, is each author trying to do, because it may mean that some words uh, kind of are used differently. Paul and James use the idea of, of, of even the, the word saved, it's a little different for the two of them. Um, faith is a little different for the two of them. Uh, for, for James, faith uh, that he's talking about seems to mean an affirmation of a doctrine. You believe that there is one God. Great. The demons believe that, <laughs> but they don't respond to it in the way they should. They just believe it and in, in shudder in fear. Uh, you believe it and you should be responding to it in a particular way. Uh, your faith ought to create in you a desire to please this God and, and serve him. Uh, so, yeah, I think insightful comments that you guys made that, 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 that talk about how things, are, that things are, are used a little differently and uh, words are used a little differently in each of these texts. Um, there seems to often be a tendency in classes when we're focusing on a particular book to treat it as exhaustive. Yeah. And it's, the authors aren't meaning things to be that way most right. of the time. Right. All isn't either. It's like, it's you know, and I like, like you say. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So, I'm sorry. Uh, I like how James talks about it that it should be coupled with action because I think about yeah. in my practical everyday life. If I believe I can sing, then I sing. If I believe I can write, I write. You know, it, we live that with you believe you can cross the street without getting hit from a car, you act on it. And it kind of yep. goes hand in hand. You can't have this faith if it's just all in your head or it's all in a, a belief kind of thing. It, it has to be something you do. And then if you look at Hebrews 11, when he gives us a definition of faith being what we hope for, but he goes through the whole chapter saying what the faith of these people of old did. Their actions were coupled with what they believed. And so uh, I, oftentimes when I think of faith, I think of it, yes, it saves you, but it, it, it like we said before in Ephesians, it calls, calls us to do something more. 
And in everyday life, it does that. It's not just a spiritual concept, or maybe it is that moves into our secular world, but it's something that we have to, if I believe something, then I act on it. If I don't believe it, then I won't do it. And that's how we measure uh, what people say. It's kind of like put your money where your mouth is. If you really yeah. believe that, then you would act on it. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, the, the idea that, that uh, faith, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Uh, James mm -hmm. speaks of it in terms of, of it's dead. It's, it's, a, it's a dead faith, a meaning, I think, useless. Uh, it doesn't do anything. It's worthless. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, it's meaningless because there's nothing attached to it. Uh, there's no there's no action that goes with it. It's just it's the hearing of the word, but not the doing. That we've already talked. About. Uh, he, he talks about how uh, Abraham's faith and uh, and his uh, uh, faith and works, uh, uh, faith and deeds, uh, work together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And that's an interesting way to think of it too. That that. That are the things that we do make complete um, our what we believe, what we what we put our trust in, what we have faith in. Um, I, I saw some people uh, Saturday, I think it was, on TV at the Bears game, who were, uh, you know making their faith complete, right? They were there in the cold. Some of them had their shirts off. They're in the cold, <laughs> you know, cheering on the bears. They, they, you know, they, 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 they had this, they, they, they believe in the bears, right? And they showed it. Their, their deeds uh, demonstrated their, their, their belief and, and they followed through with their, with their belief. Well, sometimes faith does look like foolishness too. That's right. <laughs> We're going to get pneumonia. Sometimes faith doesn't look good just to those who don't believe. Um, Rahab uh, is, is the same, uh, is, is also used as an example here at the end of, of James 2. Uh, in the same way, it was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did. But she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without the deeds is dead. Rahab did something because she believed. She had faith that God was going to do what he said and overcome and uh, the, the, the people of Jericho. And so he, she, uh, she made sure her actions uh, followed through on her faith. And that's, that's what James is getting at. That's his point. Uh, he's not saying that we earn our salvation any more than Paul is. He's not saying that, that uh, God owes us anything because of what we do. He's saying that uh, if we claim to have this faith and it doesn't create good works in our lives, then it's an open question as to how, how valid that faith really is and how effective that faith really is. Uh, and the other thing, we can, the mistake we can make here is to sort of put everybody in the same, on the same uh, ranking, right? Yeah, you know, well, my faith looks like this, so your faith needs to look exactly like this, or you don't believe. And that's wrong, too. That's, it's not our call, right? It's not James isn't saying, go around and evaluate your brother's faith by uh, how many works he does and what works he does. James is saying, if your faith, personally, isn't issuing in works in your life, then something's wrong. And, and you need to address it. The Rahab's faith is the interesting because we're not sure exactly what she's heard. Yeah. She's heard some stories about yep. this group that has been blessed and, and she's really putting her life on the line for these. So uh, that's real, uh, you know, that's the faith in action. Sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, was her was her belief exactly orthodox? Probably not. You know, <laughs> it was probably all shot through with paganism and, and and misunderstandings about God. But she acted on the faith she had, and and it and in the way she could in the moment, and 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 
Hebrews says that was <laughs> that was a, that was a, 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 an act of faith, and 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 James says the same here. I just uh, want to echo again. I think that's brilliant that you said, Patrick, and and what Alan is saying. Then we can't walk around and judge somebody else's faith, yeah. right? Because it's you don't know what why oh god answered that prayer well god didn't answer prayers like that who are we to say <laughs> if their faith leads them through their action and the completion of it that god didn't answer it that way and so that's i love that everybody's faith is is it's not up to um yeah it's not up to us judging it yeah yeah right Right, and 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 you know, the way the way that it's expressed in one person's life is going to be different than the way it's expressed in another person's life, and and that's that's you know that, that is that's all right, and that's that, that's not our business. Uh, our business is to encourage each other in our faith and and make sure that our faith is is uh, working out in our lives. Uh, uh, Matt, what do you say? Depending on what point you're seeing. Person. Yeah. It's not like electron shells where you snap to different levels of stickers. Like a sinusoid curve, like a space and balance. Yeah. Scripture seems to go out of its way to give us the low points in many of the titans of faith that are presented in Scripture, but they don't seem very weak. Well, yeah. And we all have those peaks and valleys, don't we? I mean, everybody's faith is different at different points in their lives. And it's, that's a, a good comment. We don't know at what point we're seeing somebody's faith and at what point we're seeing it expressed. And, and, uh, um, and that's all right. We don't, we, don't, we don't all have to express our faith in the same ways. Um, that's not the point. Um, notice, and, and it's easy to sort of get into the theoretical here when we're talking about this, this faith works dynamic. But James, I'm gonna leave it theoretical. He, he gets, his first example is what? Verse 14 and follow. What example does he use? Well, he's talking about um, seeing someone in need and saying, I, I hope that you know things are going to get better yeah. for you and I'll pray for you and all that. And I suppose you could say, well, pray, yeah, praying isn't deed and the action but that alone is not going to do that person any good if you don't um, say you have a, an extra coat and you give it to them or you have extra food and you give it to them or you give them money so that they can go and buy what they need uh, other if you if you just say the words it does nothing to help the person and James doesn't even hear say, you know, talk about prayer for the person. He says, you know, suppose you see this person uh, without clothes and daily food and you say, go in peace, be warm and well fed, but do nothing. It's supposed to make you laugh right. at the ridiculousness of it. Uh, it's supposed to make you just scoff that someone would do something like that. And James says, that's what we're talking about when we talk about faith without action. We're talking about things like that, where you see the need, you see what can be done. And you do nothing except, you know, boy, I sure hope things work out for you, buddy. Sometimes prayer is what we can do, right? And that's fine. If, that, if prayer is what we can do, that's what we do. Um, but I also do appreciate how sometimes uh, in, in our culture now, uh, when there's a tragedy that happens and uh, a politician usually tweets, you know, thoughts and prayers with da 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 and somebody go, we, we need more than thoughts and prayers here. We need some sort of action. That's very James-like, right? <laughs> that, that, that sometimes thoughts and prayers are all we can do, but sometimes it's not. And when it's not, when there's more that can be done, faith says we do it. Faith says we, we work out in our lives and in our expression of, of trust of, uh, in the Lord, uh, our faith by, uh, by giving, by helping, by I being there. I, I gave this book to Alan for a Christmas gift called Seven One Men by Eric McCaxis. And one of the chapters, one of the men is William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army. Mm -hmm. And it meant, he said several times, I got quotes with him, how his primary goal is to bring a person.
version of salvation. That's the name of salvation army. It was uh, changed it from something else, volunteer army. You have to change it to salvation army. But man, all the good works that they do. I mean, we, people put money into their kettles and they will wonder about where's all this going. I mean, all these different medical center or whatever. I mean, it's got a list of all these things that they have funded for. It's incredible. Yeah. Okay, so they, yeah. they believe that uh, yeah. you got to do good deeds as well as and if you're going to bring a person to salvation, that's certainly going to help. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's right. That we we all we you know sometimes we can we can get a very especially when we're pretty well off ourselves. You can you can get this sort of uh, disembodied view of the gospel, right? That it's it's all about you know what happens to my soul after I die or whatever, uh, and you get this very disembodied view of the gospel. Well, people who are poor, people who are are hungry people who are don't have clothing they can't they, they don't can't afford the luxury of a disembodied gospel right for them the gospel is very much about help <laughs> i need help i i need i and jesus did not turn from that right our example in jesus is when he saw people suffering he helped he healed he ministered he served he tried to do uh, he, he brought the power of the kingdom of god to bear on their situation. Um, and James is, is saying the same thing. It's, it's not just about, you know, what we say we believe, it's about how we live that out in the lives of people. Right? I think it would be hard to get a person interested in saving their, you know, immortal soul when they're wondering, yeah. um, you know, how they're going to feed their family and, yeah. and keep them warm. So yeah. I think we need to meet a person's physical needs first before we try to um, bring them to to Christ. Yeah, I, and I, I would even say it's part of the same thing. Right? It, it's all part of the gospel. It's all part of the, the, the good news of Jesus. And it's it's very often in very physical terms that the gospel is, is talked about. We sort of spiritualize it again because we're doing okay physically, most of us. Uh, so it's easy for us to sort of spiritualize that. Well, you know, when we're talking, when Jesus talks about the, the hungry, he means the spiritually hungry. Well, maybe, but he also means the physically hungry. And, and, and those, that's part of our faith and part of our, our belief. And so it should work itself out in our lives in that way. It seems like, uh, I mean, I hear different things, but on, on Saturday from 11 to 12 on American Family Radio, in Cersei, uh, they have this eight days of hope, mm -hmm. and they go and uh, to they call it, I think it's St. Charles in Indiana, they're talking about going there yeah. or to uh, other places, flooding in Tennessee or whatever, and they clean up the houses, they've got flooded, this and that, and uh, of course, then they want to share with about Christ. The same thing for, I mean, our church has a, a a disaster recovery type group mm -hmm. and they go to different places when there's a some type of disaster and hope to share the gospel with those people that they help and uh same thing with the Whitesbury Road Church device their disaster recovery but um they do all that good work with the hope that they will uh share and share the gospel with the person uh, the people that they're helping and that they will interested in knowing more yeah. about Christ and the Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, and that's, this is, this is what James is, is, is talking about, this living out our faith and our faith and our actions working together, uh, our faith being made complete uh, by our actions. It's funny to think of, you know, faith needing to be completed, but that's the way James talks about it. It's our deeds, what we do that completes uh, this, this, completes our faith. Uh, Patrick, I, I got a yeah. thought here. Um, it says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but have no deeds, and it goes on talking about meeting needs. And I would add that it doesn't stop with just food and clothing, gas money. It also, if we see someone emotionally having a need or relationally having a need, and sometimes we're blind to that because we all look like 
you know, we're middle class people or upper class or very wealthy people. And we don't look beyond what, what's tangible, that people may be hurting emotionally or relationally. And I was at some church years ago and that, that bothered me. If someone came in, we lived, the church was across the street from a halfway house or something. So if someone came in, everybody flocked to them and people would come and they seemed like each other and we said nothing to them. And I go, what are we doing? It, that makes no sense to me that we ignore because we seem to be, and this is, I guess, can, can mm -hmm. cross line diversity and inclusion. When people don't look like us, we, we wanna have an interest, but if they look like us, we can miss being the help we need to be to them again, relationally or emotionally. And that's where conversation and engagement is really, really paramount. Um, of course, in sharing the gospel, but also meeting this kind of need is that we go up and we have a conversation uh, so we can know what the needs are and not just assume because they look like us that everything's okay. I think that's a really good point. I think that's one of the problems in our, in our culture and a lot of our churches is that we're not, we don't do that well. We don't do those connections uh, very well. We tend to be, you know, we tend to be kind of separated from each other and, and, and we don't know each other as well as we should perhaps. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's, I think that's a really good point. Um, going along with what she just said, that uh, people that are in prison in, in, in Matthew 25, <laughs> Churches, a lot of people throughout the world doing things that you never hear about, and, and you never and, and working out their faith in those ways, and 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 that's that's as it should be. What James is doing is he's confronting this kind of easy problem, not an easy it's a problem that's easy for us to have, um, of of the fact that it, it's it's more comfortable to us to claim our faith and to talk about our faith than it is to act it out and, and live it out in, in our lives. Um, you know, we, 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 can, we can sort of affirm, a, uh, we find it easier to affirm a belief in certain doctrines or certain ways of doing things, certain ways of, of going about our, our worship or our church life or our organization or, or whatever, uh, certain you know, specific beliefs about baptism or communion or, you know, and, and throughout the centuries, Churches have argued about these things and, and split over these things, divided over these things. And in some ways, that's that's the easiest thing to do, to talk about and to, to sort of make our faith about. And that's not to say those things don't matter, but but James is sort of confronting this idea. You, you believe, oh, great, you, you affirm this, this, this orthodox doctrine about God. There is only one God. You affirm that. That's great. But you don't do anything about it. You don't do any more about it than the demons who affirm it as well. Uh, and, and you don't live it out any differently than, than anyone else. And so it's, 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 it's instead of, of making our faith all about kind of what we agree to and, and intellectually assent to, our faith has to be more than that, James is getting at. It's got to, to go beyond just our brains and, and into our hands and our bodies and, and the things that we do. Jesus lived that example, yep. and he gave several examples of the Good Samaritan parable. Is yes. a perfect illustration of <laughs> those other men have faith, yeah. yes, but they didn't help the 
the guy he tells the story to wants to wants to have a theological discussion about who is my neighbor. And Jesus says, let me tell you a story. <laughs> now, who was the neighbor to the guy who was hurt? You, you notice in that the, the, the focus of the question shifts from, you know, who is my neighbor? Who do I have to look out for to who was a neighbor to <laughs> the man in need? And, and yeah, and that's the same, it's, it's the same issue that we're talking about here. This working out, living out what we believe um, in, the, in, the, in the world around us. You know, if we don't get our hands and our feet involved, basically what we're just doing is espousing Christian philosophy. Yeah. This is a philosophy class. Yeah. Just talking about, it is a great philosophy. You know, Christ taught a great philosophy, <clears throat> but then he lived it through. That's where the rub comes. The work is always harder than talk. Basically. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think James would be really upset that people had made his book into something so, you know, controversial and something that we discuss and argue about and and, and something that we you know we we define our terms and dig in our heels and and create our camps and and that's that's kind of the opposite of what he intended when he when he wrote these these three verses. You need both parts. I think that's his point as much as anything. There are a lot of people that do a lot of good and don't acknowledge God at all. Yeah. I think that's illogical, but they don't. <laughs> yeah, that's that's of course true. Uh, I, I think most Christians <laughs> suffer from the side of it's about our head, especially most Christians in our day. Uh, we, we easily tend toward, it's all about our head. It's all about our, what we believe and, and our hands and feet and hearts and voices don't get involved uh, like they should. Uh, we come to church and we sing our songs and we, we you know, feel good about you know, our time in worship and we have our private devotional time and, you know, and it's about our ourselves and our hearts and our, our individual sort of sort of perspective on faith and I think James would, would tell us get out of your don't stop that stuff but but get out of your 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 ivory towers and go and, and do go and do what your faith tells you to do that's what we were what impressed me on this uh, trip through Ephesians on Sunday morning it's a, the, the purpose uh, of the leadership is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Yep. And uh, that's how the church is going to grow stronger. I, I, I think if we do more works of ministry or service. Mm -hmm. I don't understand yeah. how long, um, I mean, the, a lot of the Baptists must totally ignore uh, the book of James because with their beliefs that. Um, or for example, you just pray you just in your heart. I mean, take take this stuff that they believe to an extreme, then a person could one day pray Jesus in their heart, and the next day um, decide, hey, you know, maybe that they, they get together with their, their old friends and they decide ah, that was a mistake, and they just start totally disavowing God. But according to the Baptists, you know, a lot of Baptists, once saved, always saved. This guy, he 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 maybe lived 24 hours as a Christian. It exhibited no repentance, really. All he had done was pray just in his heart, and and he saved forevermore. He can do anything he wants. Well, they, they, they do believe in both those things that uh, pray Jesus, that just ask Jesus or receive Jesus, and and then once saved, always saved. But they say if, if you lead a life like that, it's just a sign that you weren't really saved, that uh, didn't really believe in that. Yeah, well, uh, they do good works too. And, and and James isn't James isn't really. Uh, this is not about that particular doctrine. There's texts in Scripture that you can go to that talk about that. But this is not about, you know, particularly once saved, always saved. That's not really James's point. And because, and I say that because it's easy to say, well, you know, these guys believe this, and you know, and and look at, and then we miss out on the fact that sometimes. Our walk doesn't match our talk either. You know, sometimes, you know, us good baptized Church of Christ folks, our walk doesn't match our talk either. And so, you know, James is wanting us to confront that in all of us, in all of us, that, that we have this tendency, and it's an easy tendency. Uh, and, and 
we, we, we got to take seriously that, uh, that faith is completed by what we do. And, and, and so we need, to, we need to take that seriously. And that's, that, that is in James a lot. And James gets back to that in specific ways a lot. And in fact, we'll, uh, we'll look at another one in, in chapter three. Uh, just a second. But other, other comments. Thank you for your, your thoughts so far. Other comments. Yeah, can we leave God saying that he's not saved? I, I think we can. I, yeah. mean, I, I think he's better at figuring that out than we I think I, we can. So I, I think we can, when we read this in James, I think we can put less, we don't have to be so bogged down in that. I think what we need to take from away from it is Here's how you recognize the signs of um, true faith um, uh, paired with works in your own life um, and in the lives of your brothers and sisters in Christ and how to recognize when it's not there um, and uh, how, to, uh, how to correct that in yourself. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's, I really do think that, that, that what he's getting at is, is to, to let us challenge, and, and it takes different forms, but to, to, to challenge in us this, this, this notion that our faith can be kind of about what we believe in our heads. And, and, and not be. Uh, so, um, Patrick, yes. Hello. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> How's it going? I'm thinking of something. Uh, is it, so far as salvation is concerned, Paul was talking about salvation when you want to believe. That means faith is what you're going to save you by the grace, not by your way. Yeah. That's what Paul was talking about. Yeah. But <laughs> James here was telling us after you are saved, there is work for you yeah. to do. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's right. right. I think that's right. This is the reason why always we shouldn't say that when you were saved, then you were saved. No. When you were saved, there is work for you to do. So as, as Paul also to, would agree, you know, as we talked about in Ephesians, yes. he says you're you're saved to do these good works and, and live a life good. worthy of the calling you've received, you'll say in Ephesians 4. Um, there's that's right. There's work to do. There's things. There are things to do, uh, and your faith can't be just this intellectual agreement with a doctrine. It's got that's to right. play out in your mind. Yeah. Matt. So taking one side of the argument. Yes. You don't want to sit there and say, "I don't have to do anything." I mean, maybe in some abstract way that could be true, but it doesn't make any sense. But on the other side of the spectrum. Can never do enough. That's where Luther was. Yeah. When he discovered the gospel, yeah. he was driving himself nuts. Oh, yeah, right. Exactly. So can't do enough personally or in terms going of to confession others. every hour. I mean, his confessor was going, What are you doing back, Martin? <laughs> and, and, you know, and he's, he's trying to get this sense of, of freedom. And that's why he really struggled with James, I think, because, you know, he was a guy who had been doing and doing and doing and couldn't find any, any peace. And he found peace in the notion that God saves us by his grace, not by what we do. And that was wonderful for him um, and, and, and good news for him. And it should be. It is good. It's good news for all of us because it's true. But, but that doesn't mean, as, Jake, as Jacob has said, that doesn't mean there's not work to do, right? There, there's still stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think mm, we're saved for a purpose, right? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. I want this to come out the right way, but I think it's important that you said it earlier, that our faith, that we're not judging other people's faith and even other denominations faith. Because I think about the, 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 fair, the, the disciples running up to Jesus said, well, what about this guy? They're driving out demons in your name and they're not even, he says, let him be. Don't worry, we stopped him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I think coming from not necessarily the Church of Christ, although I feel like I've been in the Church of Christ all my life, but there are people out there who are not professing, or grew up in the Church of Christ, and they are some outstanding people. They would make us look horrible in the sense of their faith 
leading them to serve and how they serve and what they do. And so I think we just need to be really careful using faith and whether they became a Christian the way we became a Christian as a prism in which to judge their salvation or judge their actions, because that's not up to us. It's just so we, can, we can do that without giving up our convictions, you know, what we believe. We, we, can, we, can, we can leave room for God to work in ways we don't necessarily expect without giving up our convictions. And as like Jacob said, and Laura said, and all of you guys have said, salvation is another whole ball game here. But when we're talking about people's faith and what they believe and why they're doing what they're doing, that puts us in a really, really tough spot to try to judge it or have a subjective view and use our standards of salvation on them because that's not what James is talking about. Um, he's talking about your faith should lead you to act in a, in a way that serves. Other thoughts? I'm ready to go on to chapter three if you guys are. We got five. I have, I have one other five. Yeah, go ahead. That's good, actually, because probably we can't do much with chapter three yet. So go ahead. You know, it's just a quick takeaway. Faith is an idol. <laughs> and you were talking, I go, that's it. That's a little mantra for me. Faith is an idol. It's always hmm. doing something. It's not a standstill, stagnant thing. Faith. Oh, faith isn't idol. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I thought, you, I, I, I thought you said faith is an idol, I-D-O-L, and I was going, okay, I think I know what you're saying, but I'm not sure I agree. <laughs> faith is an my idol. That's, that's good. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it, it uh, isn't yeah. idol. Yeah. That's right. It, it, it makes demands. It makes Grace makes demands on you. And, and that sounds strange to us because we believe grace is free. Of course, grace is free. But it, it does make a... a make demands on us. Uh, Bonhoeffer, and maybe this is a, a good example that Bonhoeffer talks about the difference between cheap grace and uh, talks about cheap grace, right? Uh, which is, is grace that doesn't push you into any, you know, situations like now, you, you might you might say Bonhoeffer, you know, <laughs> maybe went a little too far, but, <laughs> but, 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 but still, it, it, that, you know, his, his whole thing is, you know, that grace isn't cheap. Grace is cost, and 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 uh, when when what's his quote? When Christ when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. I believe is the the the, the phrase he used. Um, not to say that you earn it, but that it it makes a demand on you when you when you receive it. Right. I think I can see why Martin Luther didn't like this quote. <laughs> Grace once. I never see grace in you. Yeah. No, I think he saw grace in his, his brother Jesus. Yeah. He knew what it was, but he just never espoused the concept. And neither did Jesus. And he lived it, but he never, I don't think he ever used the word grace, did he? In that gospel, I don't recall him ever using it. Yeah. Paul's the main one who uses it, yeah. and Peter and a few others, but, but I don't think he ever did. The, the concept is in James. Uh, oh yeah, uh, God. You know, God gives generously to all uh, without finding fault. That's grace. That, that's that's another way of talking about God's grace. It's it's here, but yeah, the word isn't used. It's sprinkled in there, just like it's sprinkled in the Old Testament, in many places, right? It's, it's rarely used. used. Well, one or two times, the word grace. Chapter four, it's used. Verse six, yeah. But he gives more grace. He gives more grace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Which is probably a, a more reference to the, the gifts that God gives as, as opposed to uh, the, the grace of the grace as Paul talked about. It's it grace to the humble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that must mean that his audience didn't need to hear that. Just a grace well, so he didn't fall. That's kind of what we're talking about. It's like hearing one side of a phone conversation and thinking you understand the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's all of the letters, right? That uh, all right. of the letters in the New Testament. That's the problem. You're 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 hearing one side of the conversation, and then you, you'd love sometimes you'd love to be able to, to hear what the other side was saying, uh, but only in a few times, a few cases do you get that. And then First Corinthians, Paul, I think, uh, says, "Now for the matters you asked about," and 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 uh, lists some things. But even that, we're not real clear on. So. Well, other thoughts. So, faith, 
Faith is completed in our actions. Our faith and our actions go together. They, they fulfill each other, complete each other. And you can't have one without the other, right? <laughs> um, and, and so, uh, so yeah, we find a way to do the work God has called us to do through faith. Well, we won't go into chapter three tonight. Um, so I'll give you four minutes. How about that? <laughs> four minutes free for New Year's. Enjoy.